a great round of applause. Go on and praise him. When I heard a young person on TV the other night that was about your age, uh, somebody that's uh, in the entertainment industry, and she just said uh, something in passing. She said, sometimes I wonder what I'm living for. She's got all this wealth, money. She's in the entertainment industry. She's 22, I think, something like that. She said, sometimes I wonder what I'm living for. We don't need to wonder what we're living for because we know who we're living for. Amen? Let's sing that. All right, we're gonna sing a song I think all you guys know. It's gonna be a little bit different, but I know you know it, so I wanna hear you sing loud, okay? Here we go. Jesus, we're living for your name. We'll never be ashamed of you. Whoa, oh, I pray, though we are today. Come on, sing it out. Jesus, we're living for What a joyful way to start chapel. Take it all. Isn't it wonderful to know who you're living for, that your life has meaning and purpose? Go on and praise him. Magnify the Lord in this house. <laughs> praise his holy name. Father, we thank you and we praise you that you give our lives meaning, that we are not simply accidents that are plunged into the eternal darkness of the universe, but that we are the sons and daughters of light. 
We thank you and we praise you for it, O oh God, that our lives have meaning. Our death has significance, for precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. We thank you that our eternity is secure and our inheritance is undefiled, incorruptible, and fadeth not away. Here we have meaning. Eternally, we have confidence. We thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. Before you're seated, turn to someone near you and say, you look gorgeous. And then you can be seated. We got a stack of announcements here today, so stay with me for just a few moments. Graduating seniors that are in the house, will you please stand? All the graduating seniors, there they are, wonderful. This university, this university is going to miss you a lot, I tell you. I'm going to ask those who just stood, if you will please to stay after chapel for a brief meeting, five minutes at the absolute most. As soon as chapel is over, we have the benediction. If the seniors will make their way right here, just want to be, meet with them for two or three minutes and then you'll be free to go. That means that the underclassmen will be able to beat you to lunch. Or you mask will be Wednesday, April the 18th, 8 p.m. until midnight on the 60th floor at Cityplex for a commuter banquet. There will be a DJ, food, dick, tickets on sale outside Hava Java, $15 for a single, $25 for a couple. Make sure that you're at that commuter banquet. It'll be a great, great time. Spring Outreach uh, at 2013 is called Empowering Heroes. It is this Saturday, April 13th, ORU Outreach is hosting two neighborhood block parties in North Tulsa at the Tulsa Dream Center and at South Tulsa Community House. Come out to serve the people of North and South Tulsa this weekend for an incredible time of honoring community leaders as heroes and inspiring the next generation of heroes in Tulsa. There'll be dancing workshops, games for kids, business seminars, hip-hop performances, I, I know that you jumped to the conclusion that I would personally be performing, but I will be sending representatives. Free food and more. What could be more? Meet at security at 9.15 Saturday morning. After the fun run, please be prepared to drive a car or to, so that you can help in the carpool. There'll be free breakfast t-shirts for the first 350 students. Call the outreach office for more information, 495-7728. Now, let me have your attention. Turn Tulsa Pink wants to thank the ORU baseball team. Will you please give them a big hand? <laughs> the mission of Turn Tulsa Pink is for all people in our area affected by any form of cancer. They are a network of local charities who help folks find physical and financial support in that time of distress. ORU is the site for Run Tulsa Pink, Sunday evening, April 21. This is a 5K fun run uh, in a sea of pink to raise funds and show support for all cancer fighters and survivors. Turn Tulsa Pink would love to have ORU students participate in the run. Lisa Jernigan-Bain and Judy Grove are located just outside the chapel to provide you with registration forms or volunteer information. And many of you know that I own a Real Men Wear Pink t-shirt. I personally own one, and I would love to see all the men on the campus participate and wear that same t-shirt. You will obviously not look as good in it as I do, but come and put the t-shirt on and do your best. Brother Wings, get your shirts. There is a contest for the pinkest team, and ORU can win that with your help. I hope that you will take part in this. Stop by those tables in the lobby as you go out. Make sure that you sign up, volunteer, take part in this great, great event. Uh, Cadobas uh, at 71st and Lewis is hosting a post-game party for the ORU baseball team on tonight. And you are invited to come meet the players. There's food discounts, prize giveaways for all of you. Students and all fans encouraged to attend Cadobas at 71st and Lewis 
for a post-baseball game party tonight. Now, these beautiful, wrapped, beautifully wrapped Kindles. Freshmen and seniors who, competed, who completed the National Survey of Student Engagement were entered into a drawing for two Kindle Fire HDs to be given away. The NSSE is the National Survey of Student Engagement. ORU is one of thousands of universities and colleges participating in this nationwide project. We sincerely thank all the freshmen and seniors who participated in their honest responses so that ORU can undergo continuous improvement. This is a very important part of our effort to constantly improve. The freshmen and senior winners are about to be announced. If you will come quickly and receive your Kendall. The freshman winner is Brandon Richards. You have to come quickly. You have to come quickly, Brandon. Brandon was lucky, he's just not fast. The senior winner is Faith Richard. Come on, Brandon. <laughs> Try to cheer up, son. Yeah. All right. All right, Faith, I'll bring you yours. And there she is. Congratulations. <laughs> Actually, Faith, Brandon said that since you had both won, he would like to meet you immediately after chapel. We have so many different kinds of te talented teams, so many talented kids in all kinds of athletic, academic, uh, co-curricular activities that are, that are so excellent here. And not the least of these is our Enactus team. It used to be called SIFE, as you'll remember, Students in Free Enterprise, but the organization nationally changed the name. We did not do that locally. But, uh, but the organization nationally changed to Enactus. For the last four years, under the direction of Dr. Steve Green, the Enactus team has competed in nationwide competition. And, it, and for the fourth year, I'm happy to tell you that the Enactus team has won the regional championship. Now, these are just the seniors. I'm going to ask them to remain right where they are, and I'd like all the members of the Enactus team, will you please stand wherever you are, all those who participated in Enactus. These are the seniors. That means that they have led this team with uh, Dr. Green's capable uh, tutorship. They have led this team through four regional championships. They are competing against major universities all over the region, and it has gotten to the place where when our Enactus team enters the room, the other teams begin to weep immediately. It's awful. It is so sad. So will you please, as your captain, who is it? Who's going to present this? Come on. Here is the Champion Regional Competition 2013, sponsored by PepsiCo. Please give them one more round of applause. Congratulations. Congratulations. Wonderful job. No, that's fine. God bless you. Wonderful, great job. Congratulations. Congratulations to every one of you and to you. Even with Dr. Green helping, they still won. It's amazing, isn't it? Thank you, everyone. Enactus under Dr. Green's leadership and this entire university under my presidency proves that you can go forward despite leadership. <laughs> if the ushers are ready, it's time for the offering. I have a great announcement for you. What was our goal for this year? $130,000. 
total offerings received to date. Actually, I'm going to give you the offerings received in this auditorium. But every year, I don't know if you know this, that the athletic, the students in the athletic department, the athletes themselves, have made a $3,000 a year pledge for a building in China that is used by Teen Challenge. And so, not counting that $3,000 pledge that will be coming from the athletes in this chapel, total offering received to date, $128,600. So we are in the middle, we are in the middle of mission project number 29. When we finish this up today, we will pass our total pledge for the year. We are partnering with World Harvest Congregational Holiness Church in Zimbabwe to purchase 250 chairs for a thousand member church. They will provide seating for the elderly, mothers who have their babies on their backs with them at the Sunday service. Our total pledge is $5,000. If you would like to write a check, if you're visiting today, you want to write a check for $1,400. That brings us to $130,000 for the year. Everything that you give goes to this project. And then as soon as we pass this, we'll move on to other projects. We have those projects. We know what they are. We only have a few chapels left to go in this year. And so let's give and give generously a great offering. I just am going to be so thrilled to know in my spirit. I won't be there to see it. But won't it be fun to see the Sunday that they bring those chairs out for that precious church in Zimbabwe and those people who have been seated on the floor, standing in the back, will be able to have seats of honor, the elderly, thank God, and moms with their babies. Amen? In just a moment, the dance team is going to come, but first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wonderful opportunity to give and to give generously that your name be glorified in all the earth. God, we thank you for these precious Christians in Zimbabwe, Lord, who are trying to live out their lives for Jesus just as we are who are suffering and struggling through difficulties and hardships. Lord, we pray that you will bless this offering, that it may be a blessing to them. Encourage the pastor and all of his team. Encourage those who will sit in these chairs, and may they be used to your honor and glory. It's an honor to us just to provide these chairs for these precious people. In Jesus' name, amen. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Here I raise my ebony Hither by thy help I've come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from
Amen, amen, amen. The dance team reminds us that our God is a God of grace and beauty. Amen. Let's give him one more round of applause. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those, please, and I'd like for you to turn to the book of Matthew, if you don't mind. I, I wanted to uh, search through my heart and see if I could find a, a word from God's own heart. Thank you so much. Your turn, son, and take a bow. I feel a certain level of shyness there. However, it's extremely attractive to girls. Girls like shy boys. In other words, boys, those of you who are a little more confident, act shy. As I came to this um, uh, chapel, I wanted to see, what is, the, what is the word I like to leave you with? What is the, does God have a, a particular word? I don't have some big flashy thing for this closing uh, sermon. I don't have a, a big, huge sermon. It's a simple message. And as far as I know, it is both a topic and a text upon which I have never preached. But I felt inclined toward this in a unique way, and, uh, and I, I'd like to leave this message, as I can, if I can drop this in your spirit as uh, today's message, I would, I would feel that God has a word for you, for some of you today, in a very specific way. I hope it will be inspiring, but it may also have some level of conviction to you. But I want to preach this today as I feel the Lord has led me to. Matthew, I'm going to read four passages of Scripture, so it'll be lengthy. Stay with me as I read. Matthew chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 36 through 38. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now to Matthew chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. 
I don't hear pages rustling. Matthew 20, 30 through 34. Just rustle some pages. It makes me feel better. And be, thank you. I love it when we communicate. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them that they should hold their peace, but they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called on them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed Jesus. Now go to the left to, verse, to chapter 14, verses, 20, verses 14 through 21. Chapter 14, 14 through 21. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, there, This is a desert place, and the time is now late. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give them to eat. They said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them here to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke it and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the, and the disciples gave them to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Now to the Gospel of Luke for our final text, Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 16. And it came to pass the next day when he went into a city called Nain that, mu that many of his disciples went with him and many people. Now when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out and the only, mother, uh, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and many people of the city were with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bore him stood still. And he said, Young man, I send to thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet is raised up among us, and God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region around about. I wonder... If, as I read these passages, if you picked up on the one word besides the name Jesus that was consistent in all four passages, did you hear it? Compassion. Exactly. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that in the next few moments that you will deal with our hearts and minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, the strong Son of God. Amen. Some years ago, Mel Gibson's movie on the passion of the Christ just seemed to turn the world upside down, and certainly it is of inestimable importance that we consider the passion of the Christ. However, today, I would like for you to consider the compassion of the Christ. Compassion is a sympathetic awareness of the distress of others coupled with a sincere desire to alleviate that pain, whatever pain or fear or anguish or whatever goes with it. The legalist is basically incapable of compassion because he sees law above people. The mocker cannot show compassion because humor is his God. The radical with a cause is utterly incapable of compassion because his cause allows no mercy, suffers no mercy. The Islamic terrorist who blows up a bomb in a school killing school children feels no remorse and has shown no compassion because his cause is more important than their little lives or their deaths. I, uh, I went to preach at a funeral with a... Uh, um, I mean, I was in my, I guess, my late 30s, and I was with a man in his early 80s, another pastor. We were preaching together. His wife was at home uh, in the final stages with cancer. 
So he was there to preach this funeral with me, concerned about his wife. Furthermore, as we got to the cemetery for the graveside service, it was freezing rain, uh, almost what you might call sleet. And we realized we were going to have to make our way out to the funeral tent in this sleet and rain. I said, Pastor, I, I am so sorry. I have no overcoat. I have no umbrella for you. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me go and find something for you. He said, no. He said, my wife's uh, raincoat is here. And he said, I'll just slip it on and to make my way out to the, out to the funeral tent. So he pulled on his wife's slicker with a hood and pulled it up over his old head, and we made our way out to the, out to the tent. I said, Pastor, it's very cold. Why don't you just leave it on during the graveside service? Which he did, and then wore it back to, my, back to his car where I was with him, and we went back to my car. Later, I was horrified to find that people in his church were outraged, wrote that old pastor mean letters, and eventually went to their bishop and demanded that he be moved. It was a Methodist church. And demanded that he be moved and basically forced him into retirement because they said, how dare he wear his wife's raincoat to, to a, a funeral, to a graveside service? But they had no compassion. They couldn't think of his wife at home in the final stages of cancer. They couldn't think that if this old man got sick in a freezing rain, who would care for her? They couldn't think of the fact that, that he, as an elderly man, needed that. They only were outraged. They felt insulted. Now, I know that it sounds hard for me to mention outraged church members who are who are angry over a pastor wearing a woman's raincoat to a graveside service and Islamic radicals in the same sentence. However, the issue that combines them is the lack of compassion. There, there is an absolutely brilliant and classical Monty Python skit, which I absolutely love. This guy goes into a, an office and uh, he sits down, and the man behind the desk begins to immediately and horribly insult him. He says, you nit. The guy says, what? He says, you nit, you horrible, insufferable nit. The guy says, what are you doing? He says, this is what you paid me for. He said, no, I didn't. He said, I paid for an argument. The guy immediately apologized and says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Arguments are down the hall. This is insults. <laughs> See, I thought you wanted an insult. The guy said, no, I just want an argument. He goes, he goes, they shake hands. The guy apologizes. He goes up about three offices. He walks in the door and sits down. The guy behind the desk says, you're not supposed to be here. He says, yes, I am. He says, no, you're not. <laughs> he says, this is the office for an insult. The guy says, no, it's not. He says, yes, it is. Don't you see? Let me just say this to you. In the kingdom of God, we have no offices for insults and arguments. That's only in a Monty Python skit. And that's the only place that it's funny. You all say, no, it's not. Jesus, however, unlike the Islamic radical, unlike the legalist, unlike the mocker whose God is his own sense of humor, Jesus is compassionate. Tenderness is a part of compassion. Listen to this passage of Scripture. It says, and Jesus was moved with compassion. One cannot be moved with any feeling, with any sensation, unless one is sensitive enough to feel it. H how wonderful to know that Jesus was not some robotic reflection of a distant and isolated God. He, that that he, he had his human emotions intact, that when he saw the multitude, it says he was moved with compassion. This word compassion is, is actually a, a word manufactured by the New Testament writers. They, they couldn't even quite find a word for what Jesus was feeling, so it's kind of a manufactured Greek word. 
the feeling, the sensation of, of shared grief, of, of being touched, of being moved. How wonderful to know that when Jesus looked at the mass, the people, all that they were feeling, all of their... All, he, he knew everything. He knew every sin in the crowd. He knew all of their weakness, all their failings. Jesus was not a cloud or an angel or an idea or a concept. He was a physical human being. He could smell the same mass of people that everybody else could. All of the odor, all of the anger, all of the sin, all of that came to him. But instead of being repulsed and horrified by it, he was moved with compassion. Tenderness is a part of compassion, to be moved. I, I pray for you that you would find the tenderness of God, that you would be able to feel compassion. I want to give you a prophetic thought. Will you please consider this and pray for it? I believe that as I am able to diagnose the age in which you live, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about Christian college students at, at any Christian university, and more particularly at ORU. I'm talking about the, the generation around you. I feel that your generation is bordering on becoming a compassionless age, calloused. I, I worry that it will ooze into you and that you will become calloused. There is this phrase that is now used in the, in the industry of, of international aid, and it is compassion fatigue. That people see the scenes of, uh, of mass murder and genocide and starvation and famine so much that finally they become callous to it. I, I, I worry that it's even a more Shall I use these sounds like an oxymoron, but a more intimate callousness than that? It is one thing to be calloused to a scene of a, of a dying baby on television or of the genocide in some other continent. But it is yet another thing to be calloused to the hurting or the wounded person closest to you. Jesus is seen in all these passages as being moved by compassion in several areas. One of these is that I, the, passage, the first passage that we read from Matthew, I was interested in the fact that it says Jesus saw them as being scattered abroad. It's a sheep without a shepherd, leaderless. The lack of unity, the lack of connection, a familyhood. People today in the 21st century, especially here in the West, suffer from a sense of isolation, distressed, disconnected, downtrodden. There are students at this university who hardly even know who their grandparents or their distant cousins are. We live in a nomadic age. We live in an age of separation and isolation and alienation. People are longing for connection, and Jesus senses that. He feels that in people, their, their disconnected lostness, and he feels compassion. He is moved by that. Secondly, we see him as compassionate for the hungry. Those longing for bread, famished. Not simply those malnourished by the, by the word. Sometimes we so thoroughly and disgustingly spiritualize passages of Scripture until it's a, a miracle that anybody feels real practical compassion at all. Yes, there is a starvation for the word. Yes, people are famished. Yes, People sit in church with bellies swollen by spiritual malnutrition, longing for the genuine and earnest word of truth. But there are people that are hungry, hungry for food, hungry for real bread. We, we, we are, and I look in the mirror, I look in the mirror, we are overfed. We are simply overfed. 
I, I remember a student who came here my first year, a precious little nursing student who had come to ORU on a, on a scholarship from the slums of Chicago. And I remember she said to me one time in a private conversation, she said, it's very difficult for me to hear some of the other students talk about the food in the cafeteria. She said, I just have to bite my tongue. She said, this year at ORU is the first time in my life that I have not slept in a bed with a sibling. She said, this is the first time in my life I've ever had a bed of my own. And she said, when they complain about the food in the cafeteria, she said, this is the first time in my life I ever had fresh fruit. She said, I used to wonder what a banana would taste like. She said, when they complain about the food in the cafeteria, she said, I just, it's very difficult for me not to say something. I said, oh, baby, say something. <laughs> there are people around us in the world perhaps within sight of this very university, who are hungry, who long to be fed, yes, with the sincere milk of the word, yes, but also because they are simply hungry. What do we know about the hungry? The malnourished are weak. The weak are easily preyed upon. The malnourished, listen to this. The, this is a very important point spiritually. The malnourished will eat anything. Those of you that are headed for the ministry, for the professional full-time ministry, will you listen to Dr. Rutland? If you do not give them the sincere, uncompromised, full-bodied, robust Word of God, peop hungry people will eat anything. Before we sit in condemnation on people who, who take hook, line, and sinker, every kind of cockamamie thing that's ever taught on TV, before we criticize the listener, then we need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, were the people who swallowed that simply hungry because I didn't teach the Word? Hungry people will eat anything. The malnourished cannot think of anything else but existence. What that means is that they lack creativity. They don't have energy for entrepreneurism. There's nothing extra. They don't have any more to give. They can't think about beauty or bounty or grace. They can't think about goodness. They're just hanging on by their fingernails. They're survivalists. All they can think about is one more morsel of food. Furthermore, the hungry can become themselves merciless. That is to say, that in their passion, lust, determination to survive, their only means of survival may be to eat the food that someone else needs. Jesus was compassionate for those scattered abroad. He was compassionate for the hungry. He was compassionate for the sick and infirm. This, uh, this entire university was founded basically upon the platform of a healing ministry. But... Extrapolate that out to the rest of life. Are we compassionate for the wounded, for those who have suffered horribly? I, 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 one is always reluctant, nay, even loath to criticize anybody else in, in your own industry. So please take this and let me say it as carefully as I can. When we watched the nightmare of scandal unfold at a Midwestern university over child molesting, that was known, hidden, covered up, undisclosed. I, I remember seeing an article by, of all people, a sports writer. And I'll never forget his terminology. He said, what we have seen here is a conspiracy of cowards. Lack of compassion for those that are hurt may actually cause us to grant slack to those who hurt them. Lack of compassion for the wounded may allow us to give grace to those who are the wounders. 
compassion for those damaged by life, even damaged by themselves. The legalist sits in smug condemnation in the face of the suffering of others, particularly those whose suffering is self-inflicted. If you think for one moment that Jesus stands at the foot of a hospital bed where some 19-year-old boy is dying with AIDS because he's had sex with multiple male partners, and that Jesus stands at the foot of that bed and says, you got what was coming to you, then your Jesus is my devil. Jesus feels compassion for those who have damaged themselves. He doesn't, he doesn't chant at us from the walls of heaven. You got what was coming to you? He grieves for us. In the multitude of the sick and wounded, wasn't there anybody there in that whole crowd that had cirrhosis of the liver because of alcoholism? Jesus was compassionate. Wasn't there anybody there whose lifestyle had caused them some kind of sickness? Wasn't there, wasn't there a single prostitute in the crowd with some kind of a venereal disease? It says Jesus had compassion on the sick and wounded and healed them. Listen to this, and healed them all. I do not believe that you can be genuinely and authentically called into a healing ministry, nursing majors, pre-med majors, ministry majors. I do not believe that you can be authentically and genuinely called into a healing ministry unless God gives you a baptism of compassion. The AIDS victim, the intellectually limited, the aged, the senile, the weak, the defenseless, unless we feel compassion, the, com the very compassion of Christ, we will make absolutely horrific decisions. Are you following this disgusting trial in Philadelphia? I have to be cautious what I say because he is not yet convicted nor do I know for sure that he will be. But it is the trial of a so-called doctor, Kermit Gosnell, who is accused of murdering babies who survived the abortions that he performed. That he jammed a pair of scissors, according to the witnesses, into the spinal column of babies who survived the abortion. Tried to kill them in the womb, and they survived that, and he killed them out of the womb. Now, I don't care where you stand on the abortion issue, the abortion issue. This sounds like preaching to the choir. This is the kind of thing that you say on the campus of a Christian university in order to rev everybody up. That's not what this is about. It is saying, I cannot comprehend how we come to a place where the rights of the mother, all that philosophically, I'm not dealing with any of that, rights of the mother, the whole deal. How does all that obviate the reality of compassion for a defenseless baby? How do you come to the place? How can you even come to the place of such callous horror? that you can jam a pair of scissors into the spinal column of a child. One nurse testified that the child was screaming, my God, my Lord and my God, don't talk to me about the rights of the mother. Is there, are there no bowels of compassion? Can we not even grieve for the baby? We have lost our compassion on the issue of abortion, I don't, don't make it about law or anything else. Make it about compassion. Can we even grieve for them? We reduce them to non-humanity with words like fetus. And the extrapolation of that is that the fetus out of the womb has no more right to life than the fetus in the womb. I do not believe that this trial is the end of anything. I prophesy to you that it is the beginning of something. And then there is this interesting story of Jesus raising the dead at Nain, that he has compassion for the grieving. He's tender 
toward this mother, a poor little widow who's lost everything. There's no man to take care of her. Her husband is dead. Her only son is dead. She's alone in the world. She's dealing with her own physical reality and with her grief for this son. Jesus doesn't walk in there in some smug theological framework and say, now cut that out. We all believe in heaven. Dry your tears, woman. He doesn't walk in there and say, oh, you're not really grieving for your dead son. You're just grieving because there's nobody to take care of you. It says he feels compassion for her. Oh, I, I counsel you, I urge you, learn to weep with those who weep, to minister his loving resurrection power and to comfort those that weep. Everybody, you know, the, in order to get out of any memorization when you're in vacation Bible school, you learn the shortest verse in the Scripture, isn't it? Everybody says you have to memorize a verse of Scripture before next week. How many of you memorized Jesus wept? Come on, be honest. Sure you did. Certainly you did. It works in a million places. But we forget the, the great thing. He wept because of his compassion, that he felt things. Whether in the counseling chamber, psychology majors, counseling majors, there, there is... I know that you have to keep a human, you have to keep a professional distance. I know that. But if the person is sitting before you who's telling the things that haunt them in the night and drive them and drag them down, if you don't feel any compassion for them, how can the, if you don't have the compassion of Christ, how will you have the healing power of Christ? Can't we, can, when you're working as a, as a nurse, the admitting nurse in an ER room, uh, and, uh, and the only thing you're concerned about are your procedures? Someone standing there in front of you in pain, hurting, bleeding, and say, fill that out. You know, I've like lost my arm. Yeah, well, fill it out with the other hand. <laughs> There's no compassion in that. The medical industry, absent compassion, becomes simply another industry. What about you that are business majors? What about this brilliant and beautiful Enactus team? Do you realize the seductive influences that will be exerted on you in the business world to sacrifice your ethics? Remember the businessmen a few years ago that unloaded on South America tainted baby food that killed thousands and thousands of babies because they made money? That is not just greed. It's a lack of compassion to feel what those mothers feel as they put baby food into their babies' bodies and watch their babies die. Couldn't they feel that? Couldn't they feel that? Finally, we see Jesus' ultimate compassion, his pity for sinful humanity. Motivated, motivated by his messianic mission, he incarnated the compassion of heaven. He saw the nightmare of our human depravity and was moved with compassion. Jesus left the halls of heaven and assumed the human body, feeling what we feel, experiencing what we're experiencing, allowing himself to come under the physical laws of the universe because he was moved with compassion for us. He saw us in our sins and our depravity and our darkness and our weakness and our failings, and our hurt, and hate, and bitterness, and racial prejudice, and all of the other bondages that we soak ourselves in. And instead of hating us, and loathing us, and judging us, he was so moved with compassion that he made it flesh. He incarnated it. Compassion is hardest when it's the most undeserved. How many of you have heard a sentence that started this way? I have no pity for. I have no pity on. I would like to ask you, how do you finish that sentence? Where do you find the ability to conclude that sentence with anybody, knowing that the God of heaven has shown compassion on you? What will your compassion then cause you to do? I leave you with this. Leave this university with before your eyes and the eyes of your spirit the peoples of the world. 
I wonder if you have noticed that as we concluded this spring semester, I brought more and more international presence before your eyes. Did you notice it? I didn't announce it. I simply did it. I want you to remember that there are people out there hurting, sick, wounded, lost in refugee camps, Dis discouraged with life, the preyed upon. I want you to carry them in your heart, till your heart be broken as the heart of God is broken. Not just looking for sexy issues that are hot in the news right now, but also to be compassionate with the people at hand. The waiter at your table. I am always stunned and shocked when rude Christians are dismissive with weight help. With your family, can you be compassionate with your mother? When you go home for summer break and your mother thinks that you're still 12, <laughs> can you be compassionate? Your little brother, with whom something is obviously wrong. <laughs> Can you be compassionate? How shall we then, despite our fatigue and weariness and having seen all of the nightmare of the world in which we live, how shall we then overcome sarcasm and mockery and bitter personal humor at the expense of others? How shall we then live? How shall we then pray? Let me suggest it to you. Pray this, Lord, make me tender. Make me tender. Take a calluses off of my soul. Make me feel what you feel. Make me conscious of the displaced, the orphan, the refugee, the widow. Make me concerned for the defenseless, for the hungry, for the physically and spiritually hungry. Make me a healing presence in their lives with the compassion of Christ. Even as I preach the passion of Christ, may I live the compassion of Christ. Show me how to incarnate compassion as you did, to make it flesh. Show me where to go. Whom shall I reach? What can I give? Teach me how to give more. Make me a giver. Make me compassionate. Not because it's a good idea, but because of the compassion of Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Are You Alive is a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a vibrant Christian university with more than 60 fields of study, preparing the next generation of spirit-empowered leaders. Visit with your child or grandchild. Join us for chapel. Check out classes. Attend a Golden Eagle sporting event. Meet the outstanding students and faculty. Discover Oral Roberts University. Make no little plans here.